Good evening, everyone. So we're going to get started. Um, my name is Tanya Cantlow, and I'm the assistant counsel to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams, and I'd like to welcome you to Borough Hall. To my right, I have uh, Ina Gusenfeld, who's the land use coordinator, and to my left, Richard Barrick, who is the director of land use. There are three items on the agenda this evening. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to Ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number 1190078HAK. This application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing and Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State for the designation of a property located at 63 Stockholm Street in Brooklyn Community District 4 and as a urban development action area and an urban development action area project for such area and pursuant to section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of such property to a developer to be selected by HPD. Such actions would facilitate the development of a four-story residential building containing 20 affordable housing units. Community Board 4 voted to approve this application on November 14th, 2018. Would Felipe Cortez, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening, everyone. My name is Felipe Cortez. I am from the NYC Department of Housing Preservation and Development. With me tonight is my co-working Erin Buchanan, member of HPD's Brooklyn planning team, and members of the development team working, currently working on the uh, project that we will discuss tonight. The development team includes Riceboro Community Partnerships, Sinex Alliance, and Stat Architects. As part of the EULA process, we are very excited to be here tonight presenting 63 Stockholm Street Europe application to the Bureau President. 63 Stockholm Street will be a new four-story building with approximately 20 new units of affordable rental housing. 63 Stockholm Street is also part of the larger Bushwick Alliance project, which includes two other development sites, one located at 272 Jefferson Street and one at 332 Elder Street. As these two development sites will be developed with two small buildings containing approximately up to four units each, they do not require EULA, but will go through the city's accelerated EULA process approval uh, to be disposed. So with that said, tonight's meeting is, uh, is to present and discuss the 63 Stockholm Street EULA application. In summary, uh, the Bushwick Alliance project consists of approximately 28 new units of, abor of affordable rental housing across three new four-story buildings in Bushwick. Um, how can I... To start the presentation, let me walk, uh, walk you through the, tonight's agenda. Uh, I will start the presentation providing an update on the Europe application. Then I will describe the proposed land use actions the Europe application is seeking. Uh, then I will provide a description of the project site, its location, and the city, the, the site's surrounding area. The development team will then provide details of the proposed project, including the affordability levels and the building design. The development team will also discuss the two, de the two additional development sites that are part of the Bushwick Alliance project. We will then discuss the anticipated timeline for the project, and um, after discussing the timeline, we will have time for questions, so please keep track of your questions as we go, so we can um, answer them later. <clears throat> the Europe application for 63 Stockholm Street was certified on Monday, September 24th of 2018. HPD is the applicant for this application. Um, HPD uh, and the development team met with the Land Use Committee of Community Board on October 30th, and two weeks later, 
we met with the uh, full board, and as um, in, during the introduction was mentioned, uh, the community board uh, approved the project without any recommendations. This ULURP is today um, before the, the Bureau President seeking urban development action area project designation and project approval and the disposition of the vacant city owned property located at 63 Stockholm Street on block 3243, lot 65. The proposed land use actions will facilitate the construction of, um, the approval of the proposed land use actions, will facilitate the construction of a new, new, of a new four story building with, um, with again, with approximately 20 affordable units in Bushwick. The development side, uh, current, um, current conditions is, uh, is basically is a, a city-owned vacant lot with approximately 7,500 square feet. The development side is located on the uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, is located on the south uh, is located south of Central Avenue, north of Evergreen Avenue, and east of DeKalb Avenue. The development site is within a uh, is within a transit zone that encompasses all of Brooklyn all of Brooklyn Community District Four. The development site is well served by public transit. The JMC subway stations are located within a half mile of the development site. Our local bus services include the B54 and and the B the B38. The development site surrounding area is predominantly residential with one and two family as well as multi-family residential buildings ranging from two to four stories. Commercial uses can be found along uh, Myrtle and uh, Central Avenues. As mentioned before, the Bushwick Alliance overall, the Bushwick Alliance project overall um, will inc uh, also include two development sites located at 332 um, Elder Street and 272 Jefferson Street. Uh, details on these two additional sites will be presented by the development team after we go through details of the proposed project for 63 Stockholm Street. Before handing over the presentation to uh, Drew Vanderburg, representative of um, the development team tonight, uh, I would like to say that HPD is very excited to be working with the development team in the, on this Europe application and in the overall Bushwick Alliance project as it will create much needed affordable housing at a currently vacant and underutilized sites. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over, hand, hand over the development, the presentation to the development team who will give us an overview of the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us here. I'm happy to represent Riseboro Community Partnership, St. Nick's Alliance in this development project of affordable housing for the Bushwick community. So this is the next- Can you just state your names? I'm sorry. If yes, up, I'm Drew Vanderberg from Riseboro Community Partnership. Nice to meet you all. So um, we'll go through this rather quickly. Um, as you can see, this is the proposal as presented to Bushwick Community Board for uh, the full board and the land use committee earlier uh, in October. So the project, this building at 63 Stockholm will have Five studio units, eight one-bedroom units, two, um, um, seven two-bedroom units for a total of 20 units. And also, we have affordabilities at 37%, 47%, and 77% of AMI, two 37s, 11 47s, and 77s, which translates to a monthly rent of between $524 a month up to $1,749 a month. Uh, moving on. So this is the project as proposed by Stat Architecture. 20 units, four stories, ranging from 37 to 80% AMI, 3% marketing band there. Um, passive house design, which is something that Riseboro feels very strongly about, as well as St. Nick's. Um, passive house, for those of you who don't know, is a environmentally friendly and energy efficient form of architectural design and construction techniques. So this building will be super airtight, super energy efficient to uh, create deeper affordability and utility savings for the tenants, as well as high air quality and environmental uh, sustainability. It will have solar panels. It will have a laundry room. It will have bicycle storage. And it will also have a backyard. Once completed, it will 
be approximately 1,900 square feet. So now I'm going to move on to the broader scope of the project just to give you an overview. There's three sites scattered throughout Bushwick. Um, two of the sites were granted to the development team through a 50-50 uh, partnership application to a HPD RFP. Um, and so we're receiving the land from HPD for 63 Stockholm and 332 Elder. And then 272 Jefferson was also granted to Riseboro much earlier on through the third party transfer program. So these three sites together create the Bushwick Alliance cluster. This is 272 Jefferson right now on the left. It is an abandoned house, which is falling down. And this is the proposed development on the right. Also 37% AMI to 80% AMI for units uh, with a backyard and high efficiency utilities. And now for 332 Eldert, um, also a vacant city owned lot, um, which will be four more units uh, with a contextual four story building, 37% to 80% of area median income. Uh, also high efficiency with a backyard. So we're really happy with the designs of these buildings. I wanted to highlight a few uh, things today. Uh, in addition to what we talked about at the community board, uh, Riseboro and St. Nick's care deeply about creating employment opportunity for uh, the Bushwick community and the city at large. So we have programs internally that do that as well as we will be following all of the city requirements to meet those uh, goals. This includes local hiring uh, from the Bushwick area as much as possible to incentivize not just construction jobs, or uh, third party vendors like in environmental consultants or whatnot, but also once the building is functioning, maintenance, uh, supervisors, people like that could be hired locally and we'll, we'll uh, make a concerted effort to do that. Also MWBE contractors and vendors, uh, actually the architect, Stat Architecture is a woman owned business enterprise and uh, we will use our internal resources as well as all of the city and state networks available to us to prioritize minority and women owned business uh, contractors on this job. Uh, we will be a part of HPD's Hire NYC portal, which is an online database to provide those resources and connect developers and construction groups with local groups. And finally, within Riseboro and St. Nick's, we both have our own uh, workforce development training programs that we're looking to expand in the coming years, and this building will be brought into that program. So we'll be doing job fairs uh, throughout the construction period. Okay, um, I really won't get into the details of this slide, but this is about passive house. I explained it a little bit earlier, but you can see some of the features and benefits of the passive house buildings that we design, and I would encourage you to just look us up online if you wanna find out more about that, or take my business card later on. Uh, but this is a photo of one of our buildings. You can see the solar shading that allows the sun to heat the building in the uh, winter and cool the building in the summer. Uh, so it's, it's a really cool thing. And uh, that's about it. So this is just an overall project timeline. Uh, as you can see, we're in the public approval process now, and then we will be moving through financing approval. Uh, this is gonna be a 9% tax credit application that should go in uh, towards the end of 2019. And then if all goes well, we'll be in construction in 2020. So thank you for your time. Happy to take questions now. Yes, we, actually we have a few questions. Um, so the first question actually is a three-part question, and I know you had some of this before up on one of your slides. Regarding the intended affordable housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size? That's the first question. The second is what are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? And the last is what is the distribution of units um, by bedroom size? I'm glad you asked. And we did prepare an appendix in anticipation of that question. This slide was not shared with the community board, but we will uh, happily share this information with the entire city. This is public information, which is the uh, rents and the income limits that we have uh, for the project. And we're exploring and we're certainly willing to explore deeper affordability options should that be requested. Um, so you can see here on the chart on the right shows the unit sizes the AMI tiers, and then the household income limits, which is uh, regulated per family size. So if you have, uh, the way HPD does it is, if you have a studio, there's a certain number of people in the average family that lives in a studio 
one bedroom, two bedroom, et cetera. And this is based on the HUD 2018 AMIs. So you can see that the lowest income family could make as low as $23,000 to afford a studio at 37% AMI. And then we would also be able to welcome residents or families making up to 72,000 in a two bedroom at a 77 to 80% AMI range. So um, those are the details there. And then on the right, there's the entire rent range that you would pay um, from 524 up to 1749, depending on the type of unit that you are qualified to rent. Thank you. Um, second question, uh, given community concerns regarding displacement and prevalence of rent burden households, please identify what marketing strategies will be used in the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation from the Bushwick community, especially those that are rent burden or at risk of displacement? Well, uh, Riseboro adheres to the HPD marketing guidelines in everything that we do, as does St. Nick's. And there's a, there's a policy of appealing to the least likely to apply population. So this is in the marketing guidelines, essentially to ensure that when we market the building, we always incentivize uh, communities that might not be in Bushwick uh, or communities that are least likely to apply to this type of housing. So that is a policy which is designed to create more diversity and more integration throughout the city. But then another policy, which is currently, um, I believe HPD often, um, it, it's currently a bit of a controversy at the federal level whether or not we will be able to use the community board preference for marketing this project. So HPD often defers on that, and I think we should wait to see how that uh, litigation turns out. But St. Nick's and Riseboro would love to be able to offer the community board preference in marketing this project, which is also something that the HPD financing, the new construction program, allows us to do. If, if that policy is still around, when this deal closes, then we would be able to use a 50% community board for uh, marketing preference, which means people who apply from uh, community board four would have preference up to 50% of the units. However, off the record, because that is, of course, up for debate at the federal level. So has there been any consideration to use a financial literacy campaign? Um, haven't thought of that, but that sounds good. And I would add that Riseboro and St. Nick's would be happy to take suggestions of ways to deepen the local engagement with the marketing process as well as to prevent displacement. Aside from constructing new housing in Bushwick, Riseboro and St. Nick's are doing a lot of other types of programs, whether that's workforce training to create jobs and economic development in the neighborhood, or the Landlord Ambassador Program that Riseboro is also a member of the Landlord Ambassador Program HPD program that helps current homeowners or landlords in uh, low-income neighborhoods or just any struggling landlords across the city to preserve their assets. So we want to link these programs, but the new development arm of Riseboro does not exactly have a program to do that right now. But within your organization, you are doing things such as uh, training sessions, literacy sessions for folks that are looking for affordable apartments. That's right. And that's something we'd like you to do in this situation as well, you know, so integrate the things that are already part of your core mission. And however, you could take steps to fund initiatives in the community to help the community be aware of this project and help them file applications. That's really what we're looking for. So the answer you gave us was a little bit skewed from what we're looking for. So if you could take that back to your organization in terms All right. of uh, help, that's a version of helping the community not only make the 50% local preference, assuming we retain that at federal level, but perhaps exceeding it by getting really good rate of folks in the neighborhood apply. You're right. And understand what they need to do to be a qualified applicant. So that's really what those two questions we're trying to hope to get you there. Okay, I will bring that back to Riseboro. And uh, I wanted to add that anybody who walks into our office seeking to apply will receive the help from our staff that they need to create a thorough and competitive application in addition to everything you said. And all the tenants of this building will have access to all the upstream services that we do provide. 
So it is Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources focused on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. It is also Borough President Adams' policy to promote practices to retain stormwater runoff. So I know you did mention the passive house uh, design and the solar panels. Has there been any other consideration for uh, blue, green, or white roof covering and or DEP rain gardens? Um, in the design currently, those things are not contemplated because this building is not within the flood zone. Um, although we know that the flood maps are always changing. Can I just interrupt for a second? This is not a flood issue. This is about taking the wastewater that lands wherever it lands and works its way slowly but surely to sewage treatment plants. I see. Wastewater treatment. So, um, so rain comes down, you know, capturing the rain and diverting it from the combined sewer system so you can be miles away. It's not about flood zones. All right. Well, we do not currently have that in the design, but I will take that back to Stat Architecture and I will discuss what we can do. There is a backyard and there will be tree plantings in the front, which creates a little bit of uh, absorption. And we've worked on other projects. I know we do semi-permeable pavings and other types of uh, concrete-based solutions to that type of stuff, but we need to uh, talk to the architects about that. Thank you. That yes. No, that concludes our questions for this application. Thank you. Okay, it seems like there are no speakers who have submitted slips. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this application? Okay, hearing none, Richard, if you would close this item. Calendar item number one is closed. Calendar item number two, 170458 one ZMK, 170459 ZRK. These applications submitted by 41 Summit Street, LLC, pursuant to sections 197-C, and 201 of the New York City Charter of Zoning Map and Text Amendments to change from an N1-1 district to a R7A district, a portion of a block bounded by Columbia, Carroll, and Summit Streets, and Hamilton Avenue in Brooklyn Community District 6, establish a 62-4 commercial overlay within the R7A zone and designate the project area a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Such actions would facilitate the development of a seven-story residential building with seven units. No accessory parking spaces would be provided as part of the development. Community Board 6 voted to disapprove this application on November 14, 2018. Would Richard Lobel, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Thank you for having us today. So today we're presenting on the 41 Summit Street rezoning. Starting out with the area map highlighted in black dots, you can see the proposed area of the rezoning. This involves only three lots. These lots would be, as was stated, uh, rezoned from an M11 district, which is the current zoning to an R7A C24 district. As you can see from the land use map on this block, the predominant use on the block is residential use, and this is through a series of either rezoning actions, actions by the Board of Standards and Appeals, as well as existing grandfathered uses. Uh, within the rezoning area, we actually have um, on, the, on lot one a, uh, an existing three-story building with two floors of residential use above a vacant ground floor commercial use. So the rezoning would, in essence, uh, make this a conforming use of the site. In addition, the C24 overlay would allow for the uh, continued commercial use, uh, both in the vacant lot if they chose, or the vacant site if they chose to convert the ground floor to commercially active commercial use, as well as the next door, which is a commercial uh, bank uh, with offices above. You'll notice that the site, as will be discussed later in the choice of the zoning district, is located within 100 feet of Hamilton Avenue. It opens upon a playground to the southwest. Uh, there's a lot of open area to the west and southwest of the site. Uh, the site immediately faces the Battery, uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel fan plant. So um, there's really a lot of 
uh, manufacturing, commercial use, as well as open space in the immediate area of the site. You can see from the tax map a little bit of a closer diagram demonstrating both existing zoning districts on the block as well as the proposed area of the rezoning, again, the R7A, which on the site would permit uh, a 4FAR given the site limitations, uh, including the uh, rules with regards to adjacency to R6B districts. This is the zoning change map. So uh, as you can see on the left, there is the current zoning, which reflects the M11 district along Hamilton Avenue. And to the right is the proposed change. This would involve, uh, again, three lots. The total lot area involved in the rezoning is relatively small. The uh, lot one is about 1,800 square feet of lot area. Lot two, which is immediately adjacent to the site, is about 6,100 square feet. And lot uh, 60, which is our lot, is about 2,500 square feet. So this is an illustrative rendering. Um, it is a seven-story building. The actual height limitation on the building is uh, relatively low at 64 feet 9 inches. This is, again, a result of the transition rule, as well as limitations with regards to the site. Um, so there are additional uh, five and seven story buildings within the area uh, generally, which um, generally amount to taller buildings given the lack of limitations on some of those properties. You can see the illustrative floor plans, which account for the units on the property. There's a first floor with access to the residential uh, building including a one unit on the ground floor and then one unit on each of the second through seventh floors above. Um, essentially, that's the bulk of the presentation. It's a relatively modest rezoning. Uh, this would allow us to go from M11 with an existing FAR of one for commercial and manufacturing uses to an FAR of 4.6 for residential, understanding that this site itself would only uh, allow for an FAR of four. Due to the uh, limitations of the site, we'd actually despite the 4.6 FAR, would be building to an FAR of 4 or 10,000 square feet, which would result in the uh, lack of any imposition of affordable housing units, given the limitations of mandatory inclusion of housing, the lack of uh, 10 units or 12,500 square feet at the site, pursuant to section 23154D41 of the zoning resolution. We wouldn't be required to put any affordability into the site. The adjacent site, though, given a 6,100 square foot lot area to the extent that that was redeveloped would be so required. Um, so that's essentially the bulk of the presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, yeah, we have about five questions sure. for you. Okay. First question, what response would you offer to community residents that are concerned with the proposed height should the neighboring Chase Bank building property be redeveloped with the resulting impact on the backyard community garden? Sure, so, uh, you know, this was raised at the community board and we actually uh, included some slides just which were presented to the community board with regards to um, shadow studies that were performed in conjunction with the environmental assessment statement. So the shadow studies as per uh, industry standards were generated in uh, May, March, uh, June, and December when the shadows would be greatest. And so as you run through this, these slides, it demonstrates what an as of right building inclusive of the uh, Chase Bank building should it be redeveloped would cast, uh, the shadows that would be cast on the backyard garden. So um, it demonstrates that, here's uh, March 21st at 1030 a.m., and it demonstrates that uh, a, a portion of the backyard garden would be in shadow, uh, while later in the day that, um, that portion would be decreased to a de minimis amount, thus allowing for uh, light and, uh, to, to reach any of the uh, plantings during the growing cycle. Similarly, there's a shadow analysis on May 6th that was performed, which similarly demonstrates that while a portion of the backyard garden would be in shadows, um, as of uh, the afternoon, this would be uh, limited to practically none of the backyard garden being within shadow. Um, fast forwarding to June, we have a similar situation with regards to a portion and a lack of any shadows, uh, and this would basically be without shadows, at 1.50 p.m. And then with the uh, maximum impact being in December of the year, uh, this is when most of the shadows would be encroaching on the site. You will, however, notice that uh, the areas in yellow are those that would be generated by the proposal, whereas the darkened areas are those which would be uh, allowed for under a no-build scenario under the current zoning. So um, really, when you take a look at the, even in December, when you're really past any applicable growing periods, you're really in an area where by the afternoon there's no shadows cast upon the site. This, in general, has to do with the angle of the sun as well as the, uh, the easter westerly um, 
traveling of the of the sun and the subsequent shadows. So I think that I think that I'd say two things just to, to close out this discussion. The first is that um, the bank building itself is underbuilt. It's at a 0.7 FAR. When, under the existing M11 zoning, it would be able to be developed with a building. It may not be an R7A building, which would be capped pursuant to the transition rule at uh, roughly 65 feet, but it would be able to be redeveloped with a building at a 2.4 FAR. This would allow for, for example, commercial and community facility uses, which would generate, you know, at a minimum, a taller building than is currently allotted at the site, given the fact that you would have a, a base height of roughly 30 feet for that building. Uh, and the second thing I'd note is that one of the things we've kind of thought about is in regard to shadows is that um, this is uh, similar to considerations from the Ebenezer Plaza rezoning. This is a rezoning that was uh, applied for through our office within the last year and a half, where there was a community garden that was similarly affected by shadows that would be cast by, in that case, a rezoning to an R7A, R7D district. And in that case, there was outreach to the community garden and there was a uh, kind of a, an agreement that was reached with regards to um, uh, compensation and consideration of the garden, which, um, which would help it in order to further um, establish the garden, develop the garden, and allow for uh, grow lights, which would in, actu in actuality enlarge the growing period at the garden. So it was a successful outcome, we feel. We know that in this case, the backyard garden has been in touch with the applicant here. They have had some discussions. And so I'm hopeful that uh, prior to the conclusion of the Euler process that perhaps a similar arrangement could be made between the applicant and that garden. Thank you. What, what consideration was participating in the city's affordable housing fund pursuant to obtaining the requested rezoning? Um, right, so in line with similar rezonings in the area, we understand as a matter of public record that there are applicants who have uh, engaged in um, in both contributions to the housing fund as well as uh, less formal arrangements. Uh, I think this is something which the applicant is open to. Uh, and I do think that this um, is something that uh, may be accomplished in conjunction with discussions with Council Member Lander. There is nothing formally arranged at this point, but again, we're cognizant of similar applications in the area and are open to, uh, to uh, discussing this on a going forward basis with the Council Member. Recent uh, rezoning requests on this block have sought to extend the adjacent R6B district, which was established in response to community initiative to preclude the encroachment of taller buildings in the neighborhood. Rather than propose an R7A designation that necessitated the inclusion of the adjacent property and elevated community concerns, what consideration was given to merely extending the R6B district to the applicant's property? It's so particularly in light of recent rezonings and discussions at Brooklyn Community Boards regarding the, the scope of those rezonings, we're, we're really um, cognizant of this, of this concern, which is basically the effects of a rezoning beyond the applicant-controlled site. And here we understand that there are rezonings in the area which were accomplished at um, anywhere from R6B all the way up through R7A, but again, there's a preponderance, preponderance of the rezoning activity on our block is R6B, it's, it's apparent from the map. The reason that an R7A was chosen here in conjunction with discussions with city planning are, are several. The first is that the R6B zoning district on this block is definitely a zoning district which relates to the mid block and it's appropriate for the mid block. So you see much of the uh, R6B district on this block is centered ar around the uh, central portion of this block uh, between Columbia Street and Hamilton Avenue. And We've always felt that this site, as well as the two sites that are included in this rezoning, are more relating to the uh, Hamilton Avenue frontage. They are within 100 feet of the Hamilton Avenue frontage. You can see that, uh, in essence, given the, um, the intersection of Summit Street and Hamilton Avenue here, uh, the, the property essentially lies on what would amount to a super wide uh, area of the block. So uh, as between a, an R6B, which is, again, we feel more of a mid-block, uh, zoning district versus one that relates more to this open corner, we felt the R7A was more appropriate here. We would also note that the playground to the southwest of the block acts as an open area, which essentially when we look at rezonings and we look at potential districts, informs our decision as to what zoning district to select. Um, really what you're facing as far as this building is concerned is very different from what you're facing mid-block. You're essentially facing 
open area in the form of the playground, as well as low-lying manufacturing buildings and, and really the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel fan plant, which itself is a rather tall and rather unattractive structure. So that's really the reason why we felt the R7A was appropriate. Uh, we understand that this ha has been something which has in, uh, engendered a lot of discussion, but um, you know, we feel that it's, uh, you know, it really fits for the site, particularly given the fact that they would not even be able to build on the site to the full 4.6 bulk, but would be limited to the 4.0. So the next question actually deals with renewable and sustainable uh, energy resources. So that's very important to the borough president. What consideration has been given possibly in cooperation with the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA or NYPA towards incorporating passive house design, wind turbines, solar panels, blue, green or white roof covering and or rain gardens? This is something which obviously is raised at, at the Brooklyn Borough President's hearing often. Mm -hmm. um, I think here we have a, a fairly limited building. Uh, we know we, we've come to the Brooklyn Borough President's office in the past several months with rezonings which have involved upwards of 600 to 700 units. This is one which involves seven units. It's a small building. It's roughly 10,000 square feet. Um, having said that, the, uh, the applicant uh, upon discussion has said that he's open to considerations of um, sustainable features. Um, despite the fact that there's severe limitations at the site, particularly I'd say in light of the floor plate, you've got a 2,500 square foot lot and the applicant is actually providing an overage in terms of their rear yard. So while a 30 foot rear yard here would be required, the rear yard um, here amounts to roughly 40 feet. So with a 40 foot rear yard and, and a 2,500 square foot lot, you've got roughly 2,000 square feet to play with with regards to your uh, rooftop area. Uh, despite that, the, the discussions with the applicant have been that um, they would appreciate the, the uh, installation of a green roof at the property mm -hmm. and are, will explore other um, measures with their architect, but um, that's kind of where they were as far as their current thinking. Mm -hmm. So just to let you know, Community Board 6 is very involved in Solarize Brooklyn where they've coordinated with almost like a massive contracting effort so to avoid a lot of individual logistics, so maybe something to also have a dialogue through that process. Yeah, uh, I'm aware of that. I think we'd be happy to do that. We, we understand as part of the discussion with the community board that this is one of their priorities. So the, the last question actually deals with providing good quality jobs, which of course is um, important to the borough president as well. What steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises? and local business enterprises in the pr uh, process of the construction on this site? So again, I think that the limited size of the project um, informs uh, what we would do going forward um, because again, we have a, a very small project here. But despite that, again, the, uh, upon conversation with the applicant, they are entirely open both to local hiring as well as to um, utilization of MBWE contractors. Uh, I'd note that the applicant here is a long time participant in the community. They've been located within the community for um, over 30 years uh, and, and have done other projects within the area. And so I'd say that um, you know, they'd be really happy to engage and, and to attempt to satisfy the borough president to the extent possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, hold up, hold on. We have to We will now move to the speaker portion of this hearing for this application. Mr. Dave Lutz. Everyone will have a maximum of three minutes to speak. Statement. Please make statements. You can do a statement in form of a question, but it won't be responded to. I'm one of the uh, 40 to 50 you backyard. Can say your name for the record again when you come up. Hello, uh, Dave Lutz. I, I live on the block. I'm one of the 40 to 50 backyard community gardeners that would be affected by this. When we designed the garden, um, we designed it so that there would be a, a tranquility area, an area for active events, and an area for growing food and flowers. Uh, the area for food and flowers was put in the sunniest part of the garden. That sunny part of the garden would lose all of its sun in the morning 
to, to early afternoon uh, if, this if this site was built to its maximum. Uh, the gardeners range in age from toddler to senior, and we would all lose that ability to garden. Not only that, we would probably be damaged to the point that uh, we would not be able to put on the events that we do because the membership would suffer and we would not be able to keep the gates open as often as we do. Uh, we meet, we meet the green thumb standards on, an, on everything that we do. Thank you. Hi, sir, if we, can, if we can hold the applause just so we can announce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Anthony Bradfield, and following the speaker is Karen Holt. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Anthony Bradfield. Um, I was just listening to uh, the presentation, and my, I, one, one, one statement is that he, he called it mid, that it wasn't mid-block, but... You could pull the mic out if you want to... But this is uh, very much the middle of the block. This is 41 Summit. All these, um, these other lots were developed in, in the time that, that uh, we lived in the neighborhood. Um, they were all built under R6B. So it's, um, these, these, it was both, there was a development at um, 43 through 47, through uh, 49 through 51, and then now it's just recently rezoned um, 53, 55 through 61. All were zoned uh, R6B. And those were all middle of the block. So um, that, um, that's part of my statement. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, uh, this was called a modest rezoning. This was, this was uh, not taken into consideration, the 2009 uh, um, uh, uh, rezoning by, that was done by city planning, elected officials, uh, the community board. Um, these were all invested participants in that rezoning, and um, they, this would, they, the focus of that was to, to make the, the development in this area to be in scale and in, uh, in context with the existing uh, neighborhood. Um, thank you. The next speaker is Karen Holt, followed by Josh Bonatti. I'm, I'm Karen Holt. I'm a member of the Backyard Garden. And uh, I'm opposed to the rezoning because it would cast a deep shade onto half of our garden for most of the time. And plants have a hard time growing in deep shade. Um, I agree with Dave that we would end up losing a lot of gardeners, which would threaten our garden. Um, I also wanted to contradict what uh, he said. We are not in discussion about um, uh, with rights and, and um, other sort of uh, alternatives, compensation to the garden, I'm sorry. but. Um, an email was sent to us, but we are not in discussion about that. And we are not a terrarium. We are a garden. Lights would not work for our garden. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Josh Bonatti to be followed by Owen Foote. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, my name is Josh Bonani. Uh, for you, the record, you could lift the mic up if it's easier for you. My, am I audible? Okay. Um, I live on the um, the Carroll block between uh, Van Brunt and Summit, and um, and thank you for your presentation, sir. I hope I'm not being too dismissive of the project, but I can't help um, feeling that it's really just the building as proposed is a pretty just a giant, ridiculous. Um, sized building um, that no one really wants in that block and doesn't fit in with any of the other buildings um, on the block. And I think it's interesting that they always show us the area map here and very, a very short um, places given to the um, illustrative drawing of how high the building is. I mean, 
to just, uh, if I could slightly contradict what you said about this being a, a small project, it's certainly not a small project that people who live in the neighborhood, it's a huge tower to us. And um, the, the issues with the garden are a little um, less known to me. I can just tell from the proposed drawing of the building that it's going to be a, a massive building where nobody wants it. I mean, I'd like the developer to look me in the face and say this just isn't the normal case of a developer jamming the biggest building into the lot that they possibly can for to make the most money. I mean, that just seems to be the deal. And is there anything wrong with developers making money on a building project? Certainly not. But it just seems that this um, project could be, why couldn't it be shorter? I'd just like to hear maybe a, a design reason why it couldn't be three stories or four stories or something more fitting with um, keeping in line with the buildings on Summit Street. Um, most of us think about this building in relation to Summit Street and Carroll Street. We don't really think of it as it's okay to be giant just because it's facing a playground and what's now the Tesla building or the, um, or the marine terminal. We just see it as a, as a giant building sticking up like a sore thumb um, in a couple of blocks, which are only three or four stories. Sorry, we already have a giant obese building on Columbia Street between Carroll and President, and that looks ridiculous to me. And I think I'm probably not the only one here that might have that opinion. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thanks. The next speaker is Owen Foote, to be followed by Chris McClelland. Good evening, my name is Owen Foote. I, I'm speaking to the borough president, hopefully you're watching on TV. I'm here tonight to oppose this um, uh, abuse of uh, zoning change in our community because you believe in one Brooklyn. One Brooklyn in my idea is that you represent the 2.6 million Brooklynites in the community and not one person who's interested in making a lot of money off of one property without even showing us what the effects are to the neighboring properties. Fortunately tonight, we actually do have the number two. We have a tale of two projects. The first project that was proposed to us, passive house design, small sites fit contextually into the neighborhood, are appropriately scaled, uh, appropriately sized, and affordable housing. So when you say you can't be done, in an affluent community board six community, which has a lot of uh, folks that could easily pay and somehow subsidize housing, you also have neighboring properties along the block of the scale that the community is asking you to build in. All of those properties, those developers have made tremendous profit. You can go to the records and you can see all the money that they've made as well. They haven't had the affordable housing, so that's one strike against them. They, um, uh, but the idea ba basically is we can learn from the first presentation tonight and in the borough president's rejection of this proposal, as he does represent the one Brooklyn, he should put into his rejection basically everything that the first applicant proposed to us this evening to consider as a new addition to the city of Brooklyn. Thank you very much, and I'll be here all night for additional questions. Okay, the next speaker is Chris McClellan, to be followed by William Hildsdorf. Hi, I'm Chris McClelland, um, owner of 25 Carroll Street and board member. I just want to say that this project is an abuse of spot zoning and is not in the character of the neighborhood. Um, it's low rise look and feel and it has just been rezoned in 2009. I see no need to push down the neighborhood's throat this immense building that has been proposed, not to mention the additional building that could be put in in the two lots that are also being proposed to be rezoned. Bear in mind, we've only seen the rendering of a seven-story building, not the additional two lots. So 
this is something to take into consideration when really viewing this project. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. Okay, William Hilchdorf, to be followed by Matthew Neiswander. I'm William Hilgendorf. Uh, I'm also a resident of Carroll Street. I've lived and worked, had my business on this block in this neighborhood for the last 16 years. Um, and I just basically want to agree with the other speakers that I feel like it's out of proportion with the neighborhood. And um, I think we all support improving our neighborhood and our block, but this just seems uh, like an abusive uh, trying to do spot zoning. And I think an R6B would be more than sufficient. Or even, even better, taking the existing building, which is pretty architecturally interesting, and renovating it to make it uh, habitable or following the current zoning. Okay, the next speaker is Matthew Neiswander to be followed by Katerina Jerenik. I, I live at, on Carroll Street, and I just want to say, say your name for the record, please. I, my name is Matt Neiswander. I live at 12 Carroll Street. And I just wanted to reinforce the feeling that it, the building seems out of character to me, to the neighborhood, and uh, you know, I'm surprised that no, no reason has really been given why it would overturn existing zoning. So I just wanted to res register my opposition. Thanks. Next speaker is Katerina Cherenik, to be followed by Ariel Meyer. Hi, I'm Katerina Cherenik, and I am also a resident of Carroll Street. Um, and since I felt that in the community board presentation, the renderings were insufficient to show the impact that this building might have and what the neighborhood looks like already, I brought my own photos of the recent R6B um, construction on the block that you can see, and I'm happy to leave them with you, are really keeping in character. Th these are all buildings from 43 to 53 Summit Street. And again, this is part of the R6B rezoning. Um, I also have this illustration that shows the lot, and based on the very limited rendering that we saw, you can see how much higher and how much of the sky would be blocked out by this new proposed building. In addition, you can see from this other photo how the sun is actually able to hit the garden in the morning, which would no longer be the case. Um, so I'm happy to leave these with you. I also just want to say there has been much discussion about um, the modest scale of this and how it's mid-block, but I again want to reiterate if you really look at the zoning map, it's not mid-block on Summit Street, and it certainly is not to the residents of Carroll Street who live directly behind, which I am one of. And essentially, this would block out much of the sunlight that we receive on Carroll Street, both in as far as daylight into our actual apartments, the backyards of residents, so it's really not only affecting the park or the wide aspect of Hamilton Avenue, it's affecting mid-block residents directly behind it. And again, I realize that the um, presenter here is only representing the 41 Summit Street applicant, but since the zoning is for also 75 and 79 Hamilton Street, this would allow for an even larger building that we know nothing about um, that could be up to nine stories and would negatively impact our living experience in this neighborhood. Thank you. Sorry, if we can please refrain from applauding. Uh, the next speaker is Ariel Meyer to be followed by Eric Tommen. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ariel Meyer. Um, I am speaking in opposition to this project. Um, I want to mention that we collected over 150 signatures on a petition um, in opposition to this. Um, and we have them, we can give them to you tonight or make copies. Um, I also wanted to mention that, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about the 41 Summit Street project, but you're also talking about the Hamilton Avenue project that can be 95 feet and there's no shadows, there's no shadow studies, we have no idea what that's gonna look like. Um, and that's a big problem. Um, 
the other thing in one of the pictures that you showed us with the shadows, you failed to mention the shadows reach all the way to President Street. So they pass my house, they pass our neighbor's house, they go all the way to the following street. And that's, you know, we're raising children. People are growing plants, we're also growing children. Children need sun, too. Um, and um, children, schools, where are all these people gonna go to school? Um, uh, that's about, that's all I have, I think. I think that you also ran out of those flyers for people to speak. I know that there's at least three more people who came in and there were no flyers for them. So I could tell you who they are if they do want to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Eric Tommen to be followed by Melicia Malvasio. I'm sorry? Oh, he had to leave, okay. Uh, Melicia Malvasio to be followed by An Andrew Malvasio. My name is Andrew Malvasio. I'm born and raised in this neighborhood over 60 years. I don't know, in all due respect to the gentleman who was speaking up that proposed this idea, I don't think he's walked around the neighborhood. There are no five-story buildings. They're predominantly four stories. There's one huge building on Columbia between Summit and Woodhall. This is not what we want. Nobody in the neighborhood wants a seven-story building because it's only gonna bring more seven-story, eight-story, nine-story buildings, and we do not want it. Thank you. Uh, Francis Ancona to be followed by Frank Ancona. How you doing? I'm Frank Ancona. I've lived on Carroll Street for 62 years. My concern are two. Number one, they don't give consideration to parking for the people. If you walk around the neighborhood, nobody can park. Now, I have a lot. I can park, so this is not for me. This is for everybody else. And number two, the shadow sketches he shows blocks out our property, mine, Anthony's, and several other properties that we own right behind this project. We would lose sunlight from like 12 noon to, uh, to you know, till uh, sunset. Right now, I get sunlight from morning till night, right through the, you know, the backyards. But the main concern, like I said, is the parking. There is no parking in the neighborhood, and you're talking about 21 families if these three projects go off. So that's about it. Uh, the next speaker is Josephine Limondri to be followed by Jessica Miller. Everybody who's here can speak even if they haven't done a slip yet. Don't worry about that. Hi, I'm Josephine Limondri. I'm also a resident and a homeowner on Carroll Street. I've been there for many years. I don't want to give my age. Uh, I too would disagree with all this. I, I'm a, I love the way our neighborhood is. Uh, and I agree with everybody, what everybody said before me. Thank you. Jessica Miller. Hi, I'm Jessica Miller. I'm a resident and also a member of the Backyard Garden. Uh, I am responsible for pod assignments in the garden. And what I want to tell you is, is that we are already light starved in the garden. Uh, the majority of our plots are already partial shade. There are probably only two or three plots now that get full sun. So any development is going to be absolutely devastating to the garden. So I'm absolutely against it. Thank you. Okay, I believe we have some people who wish to speak but did not have the opportunity to fill out a speaker slip. If you can please come up and state your name for the record and testify. Um, 
Hi, my name is Anu Schwartz. I'm a resident of Carroll Street, and I also oppose this project for the same reasons that the other speakers gave, which I think it's not in character with the neighborhood. The height of the buildings, the building and the potential building in the adjacent lot is too tall for the neighborhood. And, um, and that's all I have to say. I'm Gail Ressler from Carroll Street as well. I also oppose this building. I think it's out of scale and out of character with our neighborhood and all the uh, potential that I see for the neighborhood to be developed, but developed sensitively and developed contributing to the neighborhood instead of turning its back on the neighborhood and pretending that it's just a building on Hamilton Street. So um, I'm in agreement with many of my predecessors and that's it. Hello, my name is Marlene Reimer. Um, I live on Columbia Street and I'm a member of the garden. I just wanted to say that I'm very strongly opposed to this building and the rezoning. Um, I have lived in this neighborhood for 12 years and I love it and I hope to stay there for many years. We have a young son who I've been bringing to the garden since he was only a few weeks old. As my friend Ariel said, we're not only trying to grow plants and vegetables and flowers and trees, we're also trying to grow kids and teach them about nature and the garden and flowers and whatever else is beautiful in this world. So I'm very strongly opposed to this building that will ruin this nature of the neighborhood. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Michael Brown. I'm a resident of Summit Street uh, and a mem happen to be a member of the Backyard Garden as well. Uh, own some property around the corner on President. Uh, and I'm a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, I am uh, uh, speaking out against this proposal, not, uh, not out of any reason for any height or light that might be lost or development uh, intangibles or any things that other people have spoken about, but um, I was a member of Brooklyn Community Board 6 at the time when uh, the neighborhood was downzoned. Uh, this was, I guess, 2008, 2009, people were saying. Um, this was a long, comprehensive, uh, well thought out process. Council Member Lander was a member of the community board at the time, and then I think got elected right in the middle of it. The prior Brooklyn Borough President was consulted. We had an exhaustive number of meetings. Um, I wasn't necessarily pleased with the outcome of that, but the community board and city planning decided that R6B and down zoning was what this neighborhood needed. Um, my personal opinions differ from that, but that was a long, exhaustive, very comprehensive process. Um, you've got lots on Smith Street directly over a train that are zoned R6B. Uh, to, to spot zone to R7A, half a mile, three quarters of a mile from the train station is one of the least environmentally uh, coherent things that I think could be done. Um, so I encourage development, I encourage upzoning all across the neighborhood, all across Brooklyn, all across the city, but it should be done in a comprehensive, coherent manner. It should be done uh, with thought to transit and to sustainability, and the least sustainable thing is a bunch of people who are going to be circling the street looking for parking. Um, so that's, uh, that's my statement on that. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers? If we could ask those who did not fill out a speaker slip, we're going to go get some. And if you could just stay around a moment while we get the next hearing item going, we could ask you to fill out those slips. We appreciate that. Thank you. If there are no questions, um, no additional speakers, excuse me, Richard, will you please close this item? Hi, my name is Fran Ancona. I also live on Carroll Street and I oppose this project. And um, the other meeting a few months, two months back, um, I think this was shut down. They opposed this and now, we'll, how does it, how was it brought back up? Like the meeting, meeting. like for this evening? Um, meeting. I'm not sure. 
that it was in community board meeting. Okay. Just for clarity, we're in a land use process called ULERP. In this land use process, it has four phases. The first phase is advisory with the community board. The process continues. It goes to the borough president. The borough president is advisory. It goes next to the city planning commission. If the commission were to deny the application, it's over. But any level of approval, whether it's exactly what asked for or something uh, not as intense as what asked for, it advances to the city council. So, so is this the next second step? Correct. So first step was denied? Or the was the first step was an advisory recommendation of disapproval, yes. Mm -hmm. So we're in the second step right now. So the first step was disapproved? I'm, we'll Correct. First. It was informing the process from the community board. So it doesn't that stop there? does just, not stop the process. So what's the third step now? The city planning commission, they'll hold a hearing in this item. They do the hearing Wednesday morning uh, in Manhattan at 120 uh, Broadway. So. How do we find out what happens you, you could contact us after the meeting. We okay. could. All right. I'll give you my card. You could contact. I will. Okay. Thank you. So, Richard, will you close this item? Calendar item number two is closed. Calendar item number three, 190071 ZMK. 190740RK, 190072ZSK. And again, those who did not fill out a speaker slip that spoke, if you could just stay another moment, we're going to have the speaker slips come down and you could sign them by the desk. These applications submitted by 550 Clinton Partners LLC and 539 Vanderbilt Partners pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for zoning map and text amendments affecting a portion of a block bounded by Atlantic, Clinton and Vanderbilt Avenues and Fulton Street in Brooklyn Community District 2. The zoning map amendments will rezone the development site and portions of an adjacent properties from R6A, R7A, and R7A slash C2-4 districts to an R9 slash R slash C2-5 district, R7A slash C2-4 district to an R9 slash C2-5 district, no, and down zone sure. portions of adjacent properties from R7A yeah, slash C2-4 to R6A. The zoning text amendment would designate the rezoning area a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Additionally, the applicant seeks two special permits. The special permit pursuant to New York City Zoning Resolution Section 74-111 would transfer approximately 70,000 square feet of floor area to the development site of which 60,000 square feet would come from the landmark church of St. Luke and St. Matthew and would allow for modification of height and setback, inner court, lot coverage, window to lot line, and yard regulations. The special permit pursuant to zoning resolution section 74-533 would waive the residential parking requirements of section 25-23. Such actions would facilitate two distinct buildings on two separate lots fronting Atlantic Avenue. A four-story building at the corner of Clinton Avenue and a 29-story tower at the corner of Vanderbilt Avenue. The proposed development would contain approximately 286 units, of which 30% or approximately 58 units would be affordable to housing earning and average 80% of area median income, according to MIH option two. There would also be approximately 34,000 square feet of a commercial <coughs> floor area. Community Board 2 voted to approve this application on November 14, 2018 with conditions. And we have with us Crystal Hudson representing uh, Councilman Cumbo's office. 
Would Deirdre Carson, the representative for this application, please state the name for the record and present the application. Good evening, my name is Deirdre Carson. Mr. Birak and members of the Borough President's Office staff, thank you very much. Uh, we represent 550 Clinton Partners and 539 Vanderbilt Partners, LLC, who are the prospective developers of the two new buildings that they hope to, to, to construct along the north side of Atlantic Avenue between Clinton and Vanderbilt. Um, as you've already heard, there are several three actions to be considered in this application. Uh, which we will be discussing this evening. I'm joined tonight by architect Morris Ajmi and his team, and also by the Reverend Andrew Durbridge, interim rector of the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew, who will tell you a little bit about why approval of the requested action will be important to the church. Uh, Alex Lieber from AKRF is also here in the event there are any questions about environmental matters. Um, this slide shows you the general location. Uh, this does not have a laser, uh, can, no, okay, well. But the, if you want to take the mic out and point, you're welcome to do that. So, uh, as you can see in the red sp spots here, uh, the development site, the project site is here along Atlantic Avenue, and uh, the church is located a few lots away, fronting on Clinton Avenue and Vanderbilt Avenue. Um, the site is immediately to the east of 470 Vanderbilt, this property here, which is in a C63A district having an R9 equivalent floor area ratio. And the site is also diagonally across the intersection of Vanderbilt and uh, Atlantic from the eastern end of Pacific Park, with which I know you are painfully familiar. The site is currently a non-conforming gas station and car wash and the home of a once popular bar that I understand is about to close. And it's not once popular, it's still popular, but it's about to close. The site is uh, around the corner, as I said, and down the street from the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew, which is one of the most architecturally significant 19th century church structures in Brooklyn. Today, the site lies in an R7A zoning district with a, a C24 commercial overlay mapped to a depth, depth of 100 feet from Atlantic Avenue and 80 feet uh, from Vanderbilt Avenue. The portion along Atlantic Avenue is the part that's subject to the commercial overlay and within this district, which was designated as an inclusionary designated area, the maximum permitted floor area ratio is 4.6 if low income housing is provided in 20% of the residential floor area. The site technically consists of two separate parcels owned by different companies and ground leased to our client. They will be developed as two separate buildings, but will visually form an integrated whole. The proposed development, as you've heard, will contain uh, uh, approximately 237,000 square feet of floor area, approximately 33,000 square feet of that will be commercial, and the rest will be residential. I haven't advanced my slides here. This gives you a sense of the land uses in the area. Um, you see a lot of community facilities in the blue, you see commercial use here at, at 470 Vanderbilt, smaller residential buildings in the neighborhood, and apartment buildings or mixed-use buildings developing along Fulton Street. There's still manufacturing on the other side of Atlantic Avenue, and as you know, also in Pacific Park, it's still technically manufacturing district, but is being developed pursuant to a general project plan that was promulgated by, um, I guess it was the ESDC. 30% um, of the floor area generated solely by the footprint of the development site, which is not visit here. Yes, the development site is visible here. You can see the church's belfry in the background. And here's another image of the development site along Atlantic Avenue. 30% um, of the residential floor area generated solely by the footprint of this site, um, or 41,000 square feet, there's another image of the site, uh, will be inclusionary housing floor area provided under the MIH program. So here is a slide that shows you the proposed rezoning, and that's one of the two actions we're going to be talking about. Um, the rezoning, as you can see, here's an R7A district, it's going to, and this is now an R7A as well, but not subject to a commercial overlay. What will happen is that this 
new uh, district boundary will be created and mapped as an R9, which is a non-contextual district in a C25 commercial overlay. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the second major action is a special permit under section 74711, and I'll come back to that. Um, the rezoning, as I have said before, will result in an increase in the maximum floor area permitted on the development site to an eight FAR maximum, allowing the construction of an additional 3.4 FAR of residential floor area on the site and the man application of the mandatory inclusionary housing program to the residential floor area, which would result in a 25,000 square foot increase in the floor area required to be maintained permanently in affordable housing units, and those units would be on site. Uh, the affordable floor area will be distributed throughout the buildings in the floors, representing the first 65% of the floors in the building. The rezoning would also enable the developer to achieve a massing of the new buildings that would maximize the visi visibility of one of the church's most iconic elements, the steeple above its chapel, which you can see in this photograph, um, which you will see has been an important visual element of the streetscape for generations. In R9 districts, tower construction is permitted, which means that the developer is not obligated to build a contextual building that would materially impair the visibility of this element. Um, the district also permits the design of the new buildings to mass the bulk away from the important facade of the church and closer to the larger structure, uh, structures at 470 Vanderbilt and Pacific Park. The second major action before you is a special permit uh, under 74711. Mostly this will allow for the modification of a number of bulk regulations which were mentioned before. They're yards, courts, uh, distance between buildings. Um, and that is largely due to the fact that on the Vanderbilt Street side of the property, the lot is only 80 feet deep rather than 100 feet deep in order to accommodate the larger piece of the building on that side of the development site. It's necessary to provide those waivers. Um, the other big component of the bulk waivers and the thing that uh, is one of the primary movers here is that it will allow to, uh, us to modify the regulations that don't permit the transfer of floor area across zoning district lines if the base floor area ratio for use permitted in both districts is not the same. Um, as you can see up here, this is, this is the church site. The church is in an R6A. Even today, it couldn't be, the floor area could not be transferred to the development site, and, and the same would be true after the rezoning. So that bulk modification will allow all of the unused floor area from the church's lot, approximately 60,000 square feet, to be transferred from um, the R6A and R partially R7A districts in which the church is located to the development site. In exchange for allowing this transfer, the developer will fund a comprehensive facade restoration of the church. And Morris Ajmi is going to tell you a little bit about that and introduce the new building to you. Good evening. I'm Morris Ajmi, the architect for the project. Um, and let's start. Um, you can see the site, as Deirdre mentioned, here on the corner or on the block on Atlantic Avenue spanning between Clinton and Vanderbilt. And here's the church. I'm going to talk a little bit about the restoration work uh, for the church as well. Uh, here's an image of the church, which looks like it's in great shape, but uh, on closer inspection, you'll see that it uh, needs a tremendous amount of work. Um, this is a drawing showing the extensive amount of work on the church. Uh, there's, uh, Tremendous damage, which I'll show you on the um, uh, bell tower, uh, as well as on the roof, and a lot of the stone needs uh, work uh, on, on the facade. Um, here are some of the images which show some of the damage, um, spalling stone, uh, damage at the, um, at the base of the building, the metal work on the uh, stained glass, and protection of the stained glass, as well as uh, here uh, you can see that as well. Um, Here's uh, some images of the tower. Uh, you can see that the stone is completely falling off. Uh, there's water infiltration. And although we've had a structural engineer 
uh, determine that it is stable. Uh, if it has further damage, it could uh, undermine the stability of that uh, tower as well. Um, and here's some more images showing both the water uh, infiltration as well as damage to the structure. Um, and um, this is the rear on Vanderbilt, uh, also water uh, problems here as well. Um, some infiltration into the building. Um, here's an overall site showing the proposed buildings at Pacific Park, uh, as well as the massing of our building, uh, which is lower than um, what is recommended for the um, uh, street wall, uh, so we can maintain visibility, and we've massed the building uh, on the corner of Vanderbilt. Uh, and Atlantic. Um, here are some historic photos showing the visibility of the tower, which we thought was an important uh, uh, element of the project. Um, this is the view looking uh, north on Vanderbilt. You can see the tower here. Uh, this would be the height of the proposed building uh, at Pacific Park, Building 10. And um, this is an as of right structure, which would rise to 95 feet. Um, and what we've done is we've lowered it for the portion of the building it's on the base and have a tower on the corner, uh, which we can see here. We've uh, altered the structure or twisted the, the structure so that the, um, to maintain visibility of the tower, uh, as well as on the corner, uh, we've kept that uh, at four stories uh, and it tilts back so you uh, have a view to the, to the church as well as the lower scale buildings uh, on Clinton. Uh, here's the elevation. Um, these are some details about the panel and the structure, materials. Um, and then um, uh, we're showing the retail at the ground floor, which is broken up to small retail spaces for local retailers. And the, there'll be two entrances for the residents, one on Vanderbilt and one on Clinton. And Deirdre, you're going to go through the waivers? I'm not going to dwell on this because I think um, you've already familiarized yourself with the specifics of the waivers, but we talked about the transfer of floor area. We have a, a non-complying commercial rear yard, non-complying residential rear, rear yard. There's some inner courts that are undersized, non-complying window to lot line, lot coverage on an interior lot, minimum base height, which is that four-story base. Um, it's, it's supposed to be 65 feet and it's Sorry? 60, I'm sorry, 60 feet and it's only 52. Um, a non-complying tower floor area below 150 feet and non-complying inner court resources on a couple of floors. Um, the, last, um, uh, the last item that we're seeking relief on is the uh, uh, obligation to provide on-site parking. And this is being, uh, this is the subject of a special permit under ZR 74533, which was created as part of ZQA and applies in transit zones, such as this area in which the development site is located, well served by public transportation, numerous um, train lines that converge at Barclay Center, buses on Fulton Street and um, Atlantic Avenue that take you to and from the Barclay Center. Um, parking study performed by the applicant showed that the presence of these many mass transit obligation, uh, options in the area, the low rate of auto ownership in rental buildings in this census district, and the combination of available on and off street parking spaces provides sufficient parking capacity to satisfy any demand likely to be generated by the project. In order to qualify for the special permit, the applicant must provide affordable housing for at least 20% of the dwelling units in the project overall, and the waiver will facilitate the provision of the affordable housing, uh, will not result in traffic congestion and not have undue adverse effects on the surrounding area. We believe on the specific circumstances of this case that those findings can be met. Um, I, I would like to ask, um, as you noted, CB2 approve this by a vote of 31 in favor, seven opposed with the two conditions that were mentioned. One is a, um, they wanted 60% AMI. Um, we're targeting 80%, I should say. Um, and the other, question, the other condition that they requested was that we petition the Department of Transportation for a loading and unloading zone for our retail stores on Atlantic Avenue. I'm gonna ask if 
uh, Reverend Durbridge will briefly say a few words about the significance of the application to the church. Hi, good evening. My name's uh, the Reverend Andrew Durbridge. I'm the priest in charge of St. Luke and St. Matthew. I'm also the uh, diocesan real estate manager on the bishop's staff for the Diocese of Long Island. St. Luke and St. Matthew has been a very important community asset in uh, this Fort Green Clinton Hill area since 1841. It has provided a spiritual home for thousands of people who have lived in the area and moved through the area. And it currently provides uh, a spiritual home for a very diverse group of people. It has a significant amount of outreach ministries that it does there. It has, uh, it's also a home for a lot of community meetings and it's arts ministry, which is an important partnership with uh, Gleam Dance, uh, who have been resident dance company there for a number of years now and have started to do a lot of uh, programs with the local community to encourage people to uh, dance and movement and various other things. It has a great uh, link with spiritual development. This project is vitally important to uh, the parish of St Luke and St Matthew, both that it will provide the funds for the full restoration of the facade of the building, which is something that is beyond the means of the uh, parishioners who are currently the um, uh, worship at St Luke and St Matthew. Part of the project also will provide funds that will go into an endowment for the ongoing maintenance of the facade of the building, which is critically important both to the parish and to the wider diocese, who sees this as an extremely important church within the diocese, and um, uh, we seek to preserve it for eternity. And, uh, and this project will provide the funds to be able to do that and will allow the congregation to focus on its worship and its outreach to the uh, to the local community rather than focusing on building maintenance. Thank you. I did not mention, but I would like to mention that um, in addition to housing local retail in our retail stores along Atlantic Avenue, which is what is contemplated for this project, the owner or the developer of the project has also committed to provide a home for Jack, which is a, um, an, a highly experimental dance slash performance art company that um, is looking for a home. They've recently um, been priced out of their current location. So with the um, assistance and intervention of the council member, we identified them as someone who needed a home and we've agreed to provide it. If you could elaborate about how much square footage that would be. I think it's 1,600 square feet, is that right? Give or take 16 to two, 1,600 to 2,000 square feet. And where are they currently located? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. So for these reasons, um, uh, we hope that you will uh, make a favorable recommendation on this project and we're now ready to answer any questions you may have. Okay, we have about four questions. First question is a three-part question. Uh, regarding the intended affordable housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size? What are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? And what is the distribution of units by bedroom size? Okay, the distribution of units is in our materials. Yeah. I have all of these slides that show the specifics of the waivers, but here we go. Um, this will show the distribution. They're on the 65% uh, of the floors. Mm -hmm. A total of 28 studios, 31 bedrooms, 24 two bedrooms, and four three bedrooms in the building, um, in the affordable. In the market rate units, it's, um, the distribution is 84, uh, is it 84 or 64? I can't read this. 64, 69, 68, and 11. So uh, from the bottom, studio 64, one bed 69, two beds 68, and three beds 11. Um, we have not yet, as I said, that we are targeting this development to be, um, there, it, it, it is probable that the applicant will seek affordable New York benefits here, in which case the whole project would, um, 
uh, be subject to the requirement to provide affordable units, 30, and we were proposing 30% with an average of 80% 80, 80 average AMI, um, <clears throat> which is not, uh, they will not all, all, of course, be permanently affordable. So we have some that are permanently affordable and some that are affordable under, and that's detailed down in this series of charts. Um, if we do that, if we're successful in that application, then we will have three income bands that will produce an average of 80% of AMI. We haven't yet negotiated this with HPD, but just for the record, if we were to say distribute between 60% of, of AMI and 100% of AMI, the range uh, for family size for a one person household at the bottom of the range is uh, 43,860 annual income, and the top of the range for um, a five-person family at 100% of AMI would be 112,700. Um, and the rents within that same range would at the bottom for the smallest unit be $837 a month, and the top would be 2,638 for a three-bedroom apartment at 100% of AMI. So that's the kind of range we're talking about. Okay, the second question deals with the community concerns regarding displacement, community uh, displacement and rent burden households. What marketing strategies would be used in the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation from community district two, especially those that are rent burden or at risk of displacement? I think um, for this, we will be heavily reliant on our administering agent. And I'll just um, ask Shah Denor to briefly speak to that question. Thanks. Hi. My name is Shah Denor, and I work with Hope Street Capital, developers of the project. Um, so like Deidre said, we will be identifying who will be the administrator for the low income uh, portion of the building here, the affordable portion. Um, we're currently, we're, we're going to start engaging with a few companies. We did use a company in the past, uh, Wavecrest Management, but I believe that they're out of uh, Richmond Hill. So we're going to look to more local companies. A few of them that we'll be speaking with are going to be, um, I'm sorry, uh, Manny, which is the Mutual Housing, New York, Org. I know they did Pacific Park. Uh, there's also Phipps House, Breaking Ground, and Fifth Avenue Alliance. That we'll be reaching out and source proposals. And we're certainly not going to be opposed to undertake a financial literacy campaign for the affordable component. Uh, and that's something that we will seek to do with our administrators. And there's another group you may want to talk to. The, the Impact Brooklyn is another locally based area provider. Impact Brooklyn. OK, noted. Thank you. Sure. So the, actually, the next question deals with um, sustainable and renewable energy. I'm so going to ask Mr. Ajme to step up. OK. What consideration has, has been given towards incorporating passive house design, solar panels, wood turbines, blue, green, or white roof covering, and or DEP rain gardens? Uh, we will be seeking uh, LEED certification. This won't be a passive house project. Uh, we will be uh, using. Uh, white uh, roof or light roof materials and uh, stormwater management. Uh, we will be building rain gardens and uh, we're also proposing to deepen the tree pits uh, to accept more water. And just to clarify with the rain gardens, we're also interested with uh, within the public realm uh, working with DEP. The we will, and we will be doing that as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question deals with uh, good quality jobs. Please outline what steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises and local business enterprises in the process of construction on this site. Again, I'm going to ask Mr. Denor to speak to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we've already met with uh, Jonelle Doris at City Hall and agreed to work with him to employ M and WBE. 
and uh, during and after the construction. We also plan to hire BTN consulting services by the numbers to assist us with the outreach program. And 32BJ, of course, we've, uh, we've received a contract with them. We've retained an attorney and we're in the process of negotiation, final contract for staffing the building. Okay. So that concludes my questions. Thank you Thank very you. much. So we have two speaker slips. Uh, the first speaker, Zamir Khan from 32BJ, followed by Matthew Lee, CEO, Architectural Conservation. Uh, for the record, my name is Zamir Khan, representing Local 32BJ. Good evening, and thank you guys for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, once again, my name is Zamir Khan, and I work as a doorman on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I've been a member of 32BJ for the past nine years. I'm here on behalf of my union to share some of the concerns about the proposed rezoning and development, uh, 809 Atlantic Avenue, to be specific. Uh, this is being pursued by affiliates of Hope Street Capital. Uh, we represent, 32BJ represents more than 80,000 service workers in our city, and our members clean and maintain buildings like the two being proposed here this evening. Uh, we believe that developers should commit to providing good building service jobs in order to f build a more equitable economy here in our city. Uh, at the community board hearing for this development, representatives for the development team expressed a desire to provide prevailing wage building service jobs when the project is complete. And we believe they made this commitment uh, in good faith, and they will follow through on that, as they spoke earlier. Uh, we're eager to continue the conversation with Hope Street Capital in the hope that they'll make a meaningful guarantee to provide family-sustaining building service jobs here in Brooklyn. Uh, as a graduate of Brooklyn Tech, uh, LIU Brooklyn, I understand the changes that have happened in the community in the past eight years and why it's important to have good-paying jobs here. Uh, it's a major, uh, it's a majority market rate project that they're uh, proposing here, and in order to be responsible, it must come with the commitment to provide good jobs for the community that we can count on. Uh, so we're here to respectfully urge you to recommend that the developer commits to provide good prevailing wage property service jobs as part of the recommendation, and we're happy that they're working with us. Thank you for the time this evening. You guys have a good night. Matthew Lee. Hello, you guys. My name is Matthew Arias Lee, and I'm uh, also a uh, homeowner at uh, 227 Delfield Street, an extension of Abolitionist Place. Uh, we do architectural conservation for the whole, down, whole of downtown Brooklyn, as well as New York City, in association with the Brooklyn Historic Society and uh, Economic Development District 2, who has initially approved of our historic uh, properties and acknowledgement of historic sightings within the downtown Brooklyn area, uh, where I am living proof and uh, unfortunately a victim of the high rises in the buildings that have been uh, continuing to, without stop, <laughs> just, you know, here, they're like, looking like New York City, looking like Manhattan, literally. But um, in regarding the already approved of over $2 million of historic proper, a historic acknowledgement located within the district just two alone, uh, uh, we have been failed behind the already promised uh, uh, projections and plans that have been made all without, within the district um, uh, where the community has been a major victim uh, or been had been major victimized behind the development plans um, I'm personally one of them uh, I personally have already have a claim of the wrongful death behind the Joy Chattel and the development plans on Duffield Street in extension of abolitionist place whereas it uh, uh, we have initially hard evidence and, and discredited the promises that was made from the district two where it opens my concerns to any other development in building high rises, especially within commercial and also now what is ex drastically expanding very quickly to residential mixed community uh, and also urban development. Uh, here it is, uh, downtown Brooklyn, in ex now in extension in association with Brooklyn Historic Society and Brooklyn Heights Dumbo area have an 
a beautiful envision uh, of what the rest of New York City and extension, expansion of Brooklyn uh, leading all the way down to East New York should and would look like with our community gardens and as well as minimizing uh, or a more strict oversight in regarding the historic properties located within Brooklyn area, especially downtown District 2. Um, initially, like I said, these are, have been concerns and uh, that have been failed to already be uh, presented or taken into consideration where uh, other home and property owners uh, wouldn't uh, limited to mobility does, don't even have accessibility to presenting such claims where personally I am speaking for over hundreds of property owners uh, in a disabled state as well in suffering from the loss of their homes. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers on this item? Good to you. Um, so I am Gurich. So I work um, for the city agency for for like over five years. Also an activist for Brooklyn Anti-Gentrification Network, a Fury, Fury, and also part of joining the group called Neighborhood United. So I'm opposed to this uh, to the tower plan with it um, with it, with the vision number one, capacity over like the schools, it's like how they infect their children. You have like. PS9, also MS571, which is three blocks from the area, and so is PS11, which is uh, in, in the school district 13. So, um, so yeah, basically, um, but also the, the worst capacity are subways. Every rush hour, um, where I go, where you see the Clinton Washington Avenue stop, it completely overcrowded. Every rush hour. It's like, if I go to be, it's like, sometimes you put it in Sardine, sometimes it's not. Because how, could, how does it impact? Impact the train. How to impact the light in the air that um that are in that are in surrounding communities. We also would not not the case that affordable housing is a scam. That is not the cure the benefit for the people for the people who get out of shelter and out of poverty. That is not the case scenario. That is that is a, that is a um, that is also um percent of the AMI. This should be 20 to to 40 percent in the AI for the, the low income and the middle class. Make sure we have to take strive within the community and make sure the benefit of the small business society with local hiring. But they also they have the issue with the youth. The youth um, needs like at school programming. Also, um, we talk about dance um, opportunities. Like um, when we need like community space, you know, like dancing. Also, um, higher education opportunities to make sure to get, get these youth out of our harm's way. So, that is like, this is the way the society used to be at. Um, we had, where, where you don't have local hiring. All these, all these small businesses along Fulton Street, they should little by little, piece by piece. And they don't give, give, us, give us back to the community. So it's a shame, you know what I mean? So um, I I'm I'm, I'm, need to be clear, they need to be, go back to the drawing board to, uh, to make sure there has to be the income requirement to make sure that we're, that we're not proper. You have, Pratt, um, you have in Pratt Burger, Fifth Avenue Committee, and the Fort Green Senior Citizen Council. Also, Black Veterans for Social Justice, because we are part of the veterans in, in the community. We are. So, so that we be clear that um, that it make sure that we're the benefit of a doubt with the, with the protected historic preservation, also to, be, to, to protect low income housing, with it, um, with the, with another key issue to make sure to get people out of poverty and our problems um, ways. Thank you. Are there any more speakers? Okay, if there are no more speakers, Richard, will you please close this item? Calendar on item number three is closed. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in this public hearing. Borough President Adams will review the applications we heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items. The hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you. <laughs>